Thank you. I should clarify, I'm not from the Stroke Association, I'm from the University of Manchester, um, but that's okay. But I am funded by the, uh, the Stroke Association. Okay. So yes, I'm here to talk to you about WATERS. Um, it's group-based psychological support um, for life after stroke. I'm going to tell you what we did um, and some preliminary findings and then maybe sort of touch on next steps as well. And the project is funded by uh, the Stroke Association, a, a postdoctoral research fellowship of mine, and um, some funding from the University of Manchester as well. Um, and I'm here just, uh, but th there's a whole team behind this project, as you'd imagine. Um, I've got some senior colleagues at the university who help keep me in check. Um, uh, an expert clinical psychologist who's been really pivotal for the project in making sure that we're doing um, evidence-based psychological support. The Stroke Association fund the research, but they've also um, been the frontline workforce that have helped me deliver it as well. And this is just some of the, the people who have been um, wonderful on the project. We also have an amazing PhD student called Hannah Foote. She's not here today, um, but uh, she's been uh, just absolutely pivotal. And through her, Sarah Cotterell and her supervisory team. Got some master's students as well, Joanna and Shiki. And then last, but by absolutely no means least, are the stroke survivors and carers who form the um, Waters Research User Group, which is small but significant and have helped me do the project as well. So obviously very grateful to all of those. So we know that life after stroke services are particularly poor for supporting psychological well-being, um, And we don't only tend to intervene when people are at crisis. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we helped people come to terms with the difficulties that stroke inevitably brings so that we could prevent them having a crisis down the line? And we know this sort of area of work is really important. It's uh, highlighted by stroke, stroke survivors all the time and by priority setting partnerships like the James Lind, James Lind Alliance. But there's a lack of evidence-based interventions and there's a lack of a workforce to deliver interventions. Stroke Association are already delivering fantastic mental health support in many ways. And we think they're a great workforce that could help in this space. And we think that acceptance and commitment therapy is a really promising intervention as well. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about ACT because you might not be familiar with it. Um, yeah, we so we shorten acceptance and commitment therapy to ACT a lot of the time. And it's a quite a, a helpful acronym because it kind of almost can typify what a, an ACT intervention looks like. So um, the A can be for about accepting your reactions and being present. So in ACT interventions, we um, do a lot of mindfulness work. So, um, and lots of different tools in the toolkit. So maybe breath work, connecting to breath, connecting to body with body scans. Um, anything to kind of get us present in the moment and perhaps um, help us have a different relationship with the emotions that we might be experiencing at any one time so that they don't um, rule us. Um, then there's the C can be for choosing a valued direction. So there's a lot of um, exercises and work to help people connect with their core values. And core values are what's your compass? What's important to you in life? What's in driving you? And there are ways that we can help people sort of connect with those core values, all in the hopes of, you know, being present, detaching from emotion, finding your core values so that you can take action within a value direction in a way that matters to you. Um, so, again, really practical stuff around identifying goals and then breaking them down into little stepping stones so that you can meet your goals. So that's kind of what an ACT intervention often entails. And it's a third wave of cognitive behavioural therapy. So our aim in the WATERS study was to develop and test an intervention that's based on ACT to support well-being and adjustment. And we wanted to do it for small groups of stroke survivors, and we wanted it to be led by a workforce of trained stroke association staff. It was initially going to be a face-to-face -face intervention, but when the pandemic uh, hit, we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and make everything remotely doable. So I'm going to be sharing with you today, peppering through this talk, what we found, um, but just a, an important cautionary point that analysis is ongoing. So anything I say today is possible to change. But we had a lot of, I'm sorry, I, I, the screens are a little bit small and they are essential for this talk. I hope you can all see them. Um, we had a lot of different work packages in waters and questions that we were trying to answer. So. We had a development phase, first of all, where we uh, actually worked on developing this intervention, the intervention groups themselves, and the companion workforce training program. And we were interested in, you know, can we make ACT accessible for stroke? Can we make it remotely deliverable? 
Can we find a willing workforce to deliver it? And can we train and support that workforce? And then we moved into a testing phase where we wanted to see, can we recruit stroke survivors to this study? Will they actually join the study? And can we screen and assess them for eligibility remotely? Then in terms of the intervention itself, well, will people actually do this intervention once they've agreed to it? Will they, will they um, stay for the whole, the whole in intervention? Can we actually deliver the intervention as we intend to? Is it safe? Will it cause harm? These are all really important things, obviously, when we're trying to develop something. And um, then obviously we need to collect outcome measures to see if it's working. And we wanted to collect some patient reported outcome measures. Um, to, you know, we thought that would be some useful information at regular time points to help us understand if the, if the projects worked. And then we also wanted to do a sort of feedback um, work from both the workforce and the stroke survivors who take part so that we can ask, you know, have you found this acceptable, appropriate, useful? How can we make things better? How can we improve it? So this is kind of all the things we were trying to achieve in Waters. And I'll tell you, first of all, about the development phase. So the intervention group itself was adapted from an existing intervention called Living Well with Neurological Conditions. And that was um, Jeff Hill, our lead clini clinician in the study, was kind of pivotal in that project, um, in that package. He's delivering it within the NHS already with neurological um, populations, and he's delivering it face-to-face. -face. But it needs a lot of work to make it accessible, and um, it needed a lot more structure and, and, and suitability for stroke. So that's where we did a lot of work with a bunch of experts, um, other researchers, and, of course, experts in lived experience, our, our research user group as well, helped us um, make improvements to the group as we were developing it. Um, so we ended up with these wellbeing after stroke groups that are delivered over nine weekly two-hour sessions. They're highly, it's, highly man, it's a highly manualised intervention. So every session has a very detailed plan for what should be happening, a detailed protocol. There's even scripts so that people can follow it and make sure that it's replicable and similar every time. And this also helps a non-ACT expert workforce be able to deliver it. So yeah, highly structured and manualized. We use audio visual resources to help people with different thinking and communication problems be able to have different ways of processing information and engage. There's a client handbook that's sent out to stroke survivors in advance of them joining the groups. And this is, again, to help them engage in the weekly content um, it acts as a memory aid after the groups have been delivered and it helps them do the, the weekly and um, the homework in between weekly sessions as well. I've talked a little bit about what an ACT intervention usually looks like. So we have all of that stuff in there. We have values identification work, mindfulness stuff, goal setting um, and, and a lot of other exercises. But we also have um, quite stroke specific symptom management type things like um, uh, tips for helping people uh, deal with fatigue, memory, memory problems, word finding issues and things like that. And then the companion workforce training program that we developed as well. Um, that's the training program is delivered over four weekly sessions, half day sessions. Uh, it's delivered by Jeff, our, our ACT expert. And then um, we asked people how they'd found the training after they'd experienced it, um, which I'll tell you more about shortly. Um, but then we had once staff had been trained and were actually delivering the intervention over those nine weekly sessions, they were getting weekly brief but um, clinical supervision to help them troubleshoot and, and figure out if they could, you know, yeah, troubleshoot really. <laughs> um, so the staff training package, again, highly manualised, so replicable, uses audiovisual resources and also is a, there's a staff handbook that's sent out um, in advance as well because we also ask staff to do a bit of homework in between their training sessions to help them embed their knowledge. We recruited and trained eight staff, um, all from the Stroke Association, all female. They'd all been working in the Stroke Association at least a year and a half, some of them uh, much, much longer. We trained... Um, five of those eight staff as leads for the project. So they were emotional support coordinators who were trained counsellors, and they had no experience of ACT, but they um, obviously were very familiar with, um, with stroke. We also trained, and um, three of the staff were stroke recovery so service coordinators, and they were um, typically not counselling qualified, um, but had experience working in stroke and had often facilitated some groups in the past. 
And the idea of having leads and support was that every session, every nine week session with stroke survivors had two members of staff in it, one to lead, one to support. So then we moved into the testing and feedback phase where we recruited 17 stroke survivors and we asked them to complete some online surveys that's that patient reported outcome measures. 12 of those 17 accepted an invite to groups when they were offered, which allowed us to run three groups between August last year and December. And each of those groups had four stroke survivors in them. Um, we, one of the stroke survivors had their carer come along as well for support. We recorded every group session, so we've got that as a record of, of what we did, so that we're going to be looking back on those and rating those recordings. Um, and as the groups were going on, obviously I mentioned we do weekly clinical supervision as the groups were happening as well. And we were also monitoring our group protocols, like are we delivering what we intend to deliver, essentially, as we, as we go along. After the groups had finished, we asked stroke survivors to complete another round of online surveys. And we invited them to take part in interviews as well to give us some feedback. Then there were two more rounds of surveys um, at three months after groups had finished, and then again at six months. And at around that six month time point, we asked stroke survivors to give us to take part in another interview again, give us some more feedback, see how they're doing now. And around that same time point, we invited the staff to a, a sort of group discussion to give us some feedback as well. <clears throat> So we had 12 stroke survivors who took part in the groups, as I mentioned. We had really broad eligibility criteria. We wanted adults who were at least four months post-stroke, no upper limit. And we didn't want to use any really strict cut-off points on assessment tools. Like, we didn't, you didn't have to be X on this tool in order to be part of the research. At this stage, we just said, you know, if you're telling us that you've got some difficulties adjusting to stroke and you want some help, you're willing to engage in, in a group that's about um, psychological support, then we'll try and include, we want to include you. Because this is early stage work, and the idea was that it would help us understand who this was helpful for. So we were trying to be as inclusive as possible. We ended up with five women and seven men, around 54 years old on average, bit of a range there, and mostly white British. Um, people were on average two years post-stroke, but again, a big range there from five months to seven and a half years. And then I mentioned we did these remote, uh, we wanted to see if we could remotely screen people, um, which we were able to do. Um, I think there are some improvements that we can make there. But what we found in these remote assessments from what people told us, as well as how we assessed them, is that we had mostly mild to moderate issues with speaking and thinking. Um, we definitely had some people with aphasia in, in, the, in the groups, but no one particularly severe. There was a, a wide range of mood issues as well at, the, at baseline, um, from you know, including some people who were quite moderately to severely anxious or depressed when they joined the groups. But they were mostly physically independent. <clears throat> so in terms of how, the, how those three support groups went, well, we were really pleased to see we had excellent engagement and we had 100% attendance from our stroke survivors. And that includes one stroke survivor went on holiday and dialed in to the group support by the pool and then went back to his hotel room. He really didn't want to miss any sessions. Um, and we also had, so over that, those three groups being run, it, they were essentially run 18 weeks consecutively back to back. So that's 18 weeks of consecutive work from staff, including our clinical lead, Jeff, who was providing supervision, which is just fantastic engagement. And again, that was including when some staff were supposed to be on annual leave, but they said, I still want to run these groups actually, well, even though I'm on leave. So really great engagement. When we're starting to look at the data that we have around what we delivered, so that's like the recordings of sessions, as well as people rate, uh, the staff saying, this is what I managed to get through in sessions. Um, it's, again, early, early stages here, but I can say that we're fairly confident that, that we del did deliver the session content as planned, and that it seems to be appropriately acceptance and commitment therapy. So there's a particular way of working within, if you're gonna be an acceptance and commitment therapy therapist, and it looks like we were delivering something that is congruent with that. Sometimes stroke survivors got upset, for sure. Um, it's hard to talk about mental health. But they, um, it was manageable. They were supported by, us, uh, by the staff in the moment. We never had to enact any really serious distress protocols or anything like that. And there were no serious adverse events 
that um, were related to the groups. So what did stroke survivors tell us? Well, I mentioned that we did interviews at different time points, straight after groups, and then a bit later down the line. Again, very early stages, so I'm just going to give you a flavour of what we found, and our research user group is helping us interpret what we found as well. Um, but most people are telling us this was a very acceptable intervention, and you can see from the fact that there was 100% attendance, people were, people were keen, um, and they found it positive. And then in the longer-term follow-ups, they were saying they're glad they took part, even if it was hard, even if they got upset during the groups. They're glad they took part, and they usually gained something valuable from the course, whether that was just some learning that really resonated with them, some skills that they were continuing to use, like mindfulness practices, or um, even signposting onto other services that, that we gave them or other research projects as well. They've, some of them have become mindfulness advocates. Um, but they also gave us uh, some things to think about in terms of how we can improve things. So um, we do need to think very carefully about group dynamics when we think about group interventions in general. Um, there's added magic that comes sometimes from if you get a group in the room that are just buzzing off one another, that can be added magic as well as the therapy that you're providing. So we want to think about that. And one of the things that might help the stroke survivors was telling us is having a couple more people in groups, maybe six people to eight people. Um, we need to think about when we offer an intervention like this, when time post-stroke is when it's most appropriate. And we've got some tips from our stroke survivors around, and from our research user group, around how we can make this whole thing even more accessible for people with thinking and speaking problems. Stroke survivors also told us things through their many online surveys that they completed. Um, but we've done no formal analysis yet. And even when we do, I have to emphasise, obviously this is a very small small numbers in this project, so we're not powered to look at clinical or cost effectiveness in this, in this study. But I can tell you we've got good completion of all of the surveys at the different time points. They seem to be taking about 20 to 30 minutes to complete, which feels, which stroke survivors are telling us is acceptable. They can mostly complete them independently. They don't need researcher support. They can get along with this online platform that we used for surveys. And we think that the measures that we've used, um, so not only are they completable by stroke survivors, but we think that they would be useful for exploring clinical and cost effectiveness in future. So um, I won't really go into them today, but we've got you know, stuff around mood, well-being, things that you might expect for a psychological support study. What did the staff tell us? Well, again, cautionary early, early findings, but we did do our interviews and our group discussion with staff. And they told us they really enjoyed the training and they enjoyed delivering groups, but of course it was tiring and it was time consuming. But they, did, they felt like they learned a lot, not just in terms of um, for stroke survivors, but for them, themselves and their own skills. They believed that this would be a positive thing for stroke survivors, so they were really highly motivated to deliver sessions, even when they were supposed to be on annual leave. <laughs> um, straight after training, when we spoke to staff, there were varying degrees of confidence around, oh, I'm not sure about delivering this to stroke survivors, actually, it's a lot. Um, but that confidence and skills, they grew rapidly as the sessions progressed. I think they, they, grow, they got more um, comfortable with using those script-informed protocols to deliver this structured um, intervention. And the lovely thing is, at the end, the, support, the, the staff that had been trained as support were telling us, actually, I now feel confident to lead a session, which would be wonderful if we can upskill even more people to deliver something like this, then we've got a bigger workforce. But again, the staff have given us a lot of things to think about in terms of how to improve. So whether that's um, the content itself, again, the staff told us they think larger group sizes would work. And staff need more protected time for this. They, they did go over and above and beyond um, because we didn't know how much time this would take, really. We were testing things out. But they would need more time before groups to help them prepare and after groups to help them debrief with clients if there'd been some upset or, or something's come up for them during a session. So just coming back to this very detailed kind of work packages and research questions that we were trying to answer, I think we, we can say that we mostly, either mostly, totally or partially answered a lot of the questions that we set out to answer. So we, we can achieve, we've done a lot that we can be proud of. Um, but, but what do we have? Well, we've got a lot of data to analyze. Um, but we have this manualized, co-developed psychological support program and a workforce training program that has some promising proof of principle for supporting well-being after stroke. And we've got some really practical information to support improvements. And, and, and we can implement those improvements quite readily, actually. 
So in terms of next steps, well, we need to complete analysis and write up our findings in various formats, including a short accessible report for our research participants. And then anyone who knows me and my past research would know that I usually work towards doing large scale randomized control trials, but that's not where I want to go with this. Um, depending on how, what the analysis, the formal analysis is saying, I would really like to explore doing some real implementation science research. And basically, let's just do it. <laughs> we're, we're failing people in the mental health space. So let's just see it, do it, and monitor it really closely. And as long as it's not causing harm, and as long as it seems to be, we can understand what makes it work or what doesn't make it work, let's monitor it closely. If it's not working, stop it. And if it is working, carry it on. That's where I'd like to go with this. So I guess I'll finish on a call to action, really. If you're interested in helping with next steps, whether you're a stroke survivor who's interested in collaborating with us as a research user group member, an implementation scientist, because I've not done much of this work to help me do it well. And of course, we need people who are working with stroke survivors and who might be willing to get trained in delivering an, a, a, an intervention like this. So if you are interested, then please feel free to contact me. And thank you for listening. I think, um, yeah, I, I know um, I, timing's a bit off, but I maybe cannot take one question. Um. Oh. So are you, saying that you'd, thanks. are you saying that you would be happy to train? Um, I'm an OT. Uh, hmm. I'll start with that. I'm an OT, and I work in Bolton, and I have been on the community neuro team, and I'm now on the stroke team. Hmm. Um, the community, both of those teams have run like a fatigue management group and they did a, like a cognitive and a psychology group. Mm -hmm. But it sounds, from the sounds of it, it sounds like you encompass all of that into one thing. Um, it feels very much like a psychological support program. I shouldn't oversell But no, it. but you like talk <laughs> about fatigue, et cetera, and things like that. And mm -hmm. uh, so are you willing to like um, train, you know, myself or like our community team to then deliver that group? Is that what your aim is? I'm super open to it. I mean, it's very early stages. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, the, the stroke recovery service coordinators who were telling us, I could lead this now, having shadowed it, having, having watched how this gets delivered, um, that they're not, you know, yeah, I, I think they are more than capable. So I think with the right training and support, this, a, a lot of people with, as long as you've got some skills in stroke, you understand stroke and perhaps understanding facilitating groups, I'm, I'm definitely super open to it, yeah. Yeah, because I did the fatigue management group before. Amazing, um, yeah. But we obviously stopped because of COVID, so we're looking at yeah. starting to run I, groups. I definitely don't think psychological support should be the remit of psychological people. You know, everyone should be involved in that, right? in our team as well. Yeah, which is really fantastic. wonderful. Let's, let's Can I just on. chip in just to say um, that uh, we do have a psychological, psychology clinical lead um, starting very soon, so I think this kind of intervention is something that we can consider as part of our work to develop a pathway so i think um a bit like the, the pressure monitoring at home program you know implementation perhaps through the network in some shape or form might be possible great thank you lovely thanks Sarah.